Chapter Master, we have engaged the heretics at the chemical processing facility in the volcanic ash wastes. They have brought many great war machines to bear, and they attack with savage ferocity. However, we shall know no fear in the face of our adversary, for we bring the light of the angel and the justice of the emperor. Welcome back to the Forge of Sagas. In today's video, I challenged myself to see how much industrial terrain I could build out of a single packing insert. I'll show you a little sampling of what I built right here at the start, but if you want to see everything, you'll have to stay tuned for the rest of the video. So without further ado, let's get started. The basis for this project was this packing insert. I recently helped my parents remodel their kitchen and in return, I got a lot of the packing material, including the sink. This was where the faucet came in, so you can see the little curved bit, places for the rest of the hardware, etc. But, flip it over, and you can already see, just from looking at it, we've got the potential for some nice sci-fi industrial buildings. So, the challenge today is to see how many different pieces of terrain we can squeeze out of this one packing insert. I started by coming in with a sharpie and tracing out anywhere I thought there would be a nice form for a building. This took me a lot of time off camera, just sitting around with the piece and saying, Oh, well, what could this be? Where might be a nice place to cut where I can preserve as much of the structure as possible. So just have at it, you know, take some time in your prep phase and really think about what you want to make before you come in and start working on it. Then once you've traced all your lines, go ahead and cut it out with a pair of scissors. Before we get started with the build, actually I'm going to go through all the different pieces I pulled out and give them names. This is the pump house. It's got that long tubular thing, which I can see as kind of a pump. It accelerates a fluid through it, going from one end to another, and the building houses the machinery that helps effectuate that. So, that's kind of cool. That's a nice shape. It's going to make a nice centerpiece building, I think. This particularly square and building-shaped piece is going to be the foreman's hut. Now, someone's got to run this industrial complex, and this looks like the kind of building you might run it from. This section looks like a wall, and will therefore appropriately be called the wall. You know, sometimes a shape just is what it is. <laughs> Given the rounded nature of this, kind of that cylindrical shape at the top, looks kind of like an industrial storage tank of some kind that's been embedded in concrete. So, we're gonna call this one the tank. This little piece looks like a kind of backup power generator. It's got a little support on it. Maybe that'll be tied to a platform or something. So, we're gonna go ahead and call this one the generator. This one has another one of those obvious shapes. It's definitely some sort of pipeline. What's flowing through it? I don't know. We'll see how the build goes and we'll develop that as we go along. But for now, we're just going to call it the pipeline. This last shape was kind of what was left and it didn't really speak to me and I didn't see anything in it initially. But, you know, I had this big gap in the middle and I was like, yeah, I can at least put a platform on top of it and maybe some walkways to connect it to other platforms and structures. So we're going to call it the nexus, something to just sit at the middle and connect everything. The first thing we have to do is clean up the structure. So we're going to take our scissors and cut off any excess material that we don't want to use. For me, I'm getting rid of this little curved up piece because it's going to make it hard to base and just overall it doesn't look right. The first problem we have to solve is all of the big holes that were left over from cutting apart the packing insert. To fix this, we're going to grab some regular corrugated cardboard that you have lying around and trace out the shape of the wall onto the cardboard. The other thing this cardboard allows us to do is to cover up that pebbly texture that we have on the outside of the packing insert. The inside is smooth to protect the products, the outside not quite so much. Now, this is a very good texture if you want to do like nicely pitted concrete that's had battle damage and industrial corrosion, and we will have some of that, but I still wanted the majority of these buildings to be metal, so I'm going to cover that up to give me a nice smooth surface to paint on. Once you have it cut out, do a quick dry fit, just comparing it to the wall to make sure you cut it correctly then grab your hot glue gun and glue it all in place. As you can see here, you're gonna need a lot of refills for your hot glue gun while you're doing this kind of a project, so make sure you got plenty of extra glue sticks on hand. However, it won't be so easy for all of your pieces. As we can see over at the pump house, there's a little bit of a weird angle and gap between the two sides of this particular wall. So to solve that problem, I'm just gonna cut out this part of the wall and replace it with the cardboard. Same thing you do in the previous step, you just won't have the backing wall to glue it on, so you'll have to glue it to the interior of the other walls. Now this is all well and good for flat panels, and you can see I've clad up a lot of the outside of the pump house, but we still have to deal with the pump itself. Corrugated cardboard doesn't bend very well, but cereal box cardboard does. 
You can see here it folds right over, it doesn't have any nasty creases in it, and it makes a really nice fit for any of these curved areas. Again, once you have your test cut, make sure you dry fit it, and then go ahead and be ready to glue it in. I'm going to do this across the entire piece and come back when it's done. You can do the exact same thing on a curve, except instead of keeping it as a square, you're going to have to cut it into a triangle. You can see that I started by hot gluing in the small end first. This just gives you a little bit of an easier surface to work in when you have to hold that bend, and it lessens the likelihood you're going to burn yourself. Another material I like for this kind of detailing is these really thin foam sheets that I get at the craft store. They're still really flexible, but they're thicker than paper or cardboard, so they're really nice for adding that external banding that you might see on industrial structures or piping. Now, we don't have to completely cover all the holes. Some of them can give us some detail. Here on the Nexus, I had this hole which I thought would make a really nice industrial grate. So I cut myself a slightly larger piece of cardboard and added a layer of cross stitch mesh and set the whole thing back in there to give myself a nice little vent coming out of that building. Next we're going to add some cladding to the edges to help clean up the gaps between the structure and the external cardboard. You can see I put some packing tape on the edges to hold it together and give me a nice smooth surface and this is a good idea. However, I did make the strips of tape a little bit long and in the final product there were a few minor places where I could see just a little bit of the tape exposed. So, my advice here is to take smaller pieces of tape and really just focus under the area you're going to clad over with cereal box cardboard. So, cut it into shape, and then I use some Eileen's Tacky Glue to secure it in place. With the tank, I ended up deciding that I wasn't going to be able to create enough distinction between the metal part of the tank, which I wanted to be the top, and the bottom part where I wanted it to be the concrete it was sitting in, without having there be a really awkward gap that I would have to fill if I used cereal box cardboard or my foam. So I grabbed a pint-sized can of hard cider and cut off all the top areas of the packing insert to make way for me to insert the can. This is going to give me that distinction where there's definitely the cardboard which is going to have that concrete texture, and then there's going to be the metal of the can. Once we have everything cut out and we think we're ready, we're going to do a little dry fit to make sure we don't have to do any additional cutting, which I don't. So then we're going to grab our hot glue gun and glue this in place. Another thing that I didn't have footage of because I kind of did it last minute because I'd forgotten about it is to fill in the front and the back of the can with a circle of cardboard. I use chipboard for this just because it's a little bit thinner. This will help hide those iconic textures on the can that give it away as a can and make it look more like the industrial tank we want it to be. If there's a gap in the insert that you want to have the concrete texture, you can go ahead and just put a piece of cardboard in there and then cover it with spackle. I find that it really nicely matches the texture that we already have on the packing insert. So it's really easy to work with. Just make sure you fill in all the gaps and don't leave anything exposed. I also took this opportunity to fill in a couple of little gaps that I had between the can and the packing insert to really reinforce the idea that this tank is solidly embedded in this concrete structure. Next up is the wall, and the biggest thing I had to decide here was which side was going to be the front and which side was going to be the back. I decided to make the smooth part the back because I felt it would be much easier to attach a platform there. So I cut away this little broken part at the front. However, I decided to save the top part of it because this could make a nice little collapse section of wall on the other end. It took me quite a while to figure out what I was going to do with the Nexus, but I found this cardboard tube and suddenly it hit me. Oh, what if I make this a big juncture for a pipeline? You know, tons of pipes everywhere, this one big main pipe and then it branches out, so all kinds of other pipes. That could look really cool. Once I'd measured how long I needed the pipe to be to run the length of the Nexus, I came in with my knife and cut it out placed it in there just to make double sure, and then I grabbed these PVC pipe 45 bends. I chose them just because they were different than the normal 90 degree angles that we tend to see. The other benefit is it creates this cool little space under the pipe where a single model could hide. This is especially useful in games like Kill Team or Necromunda where, again, you're only working with one model, you're not working with a full unit. So hot glued that to a piece of the cardboard pipe that I'd cut at a 45 degree angle so it would be flat with a tabletop, and then I glued that combination to the main pipe. The foreman's building had so much flat, empty space that it really needed something to break up that profile. To start off, I came in with this plastic container that I'd gotten some plants in from the nursery, and I glued that to the top. This could maybe serve as like a little comms tower if we added a bunch of antenna to it, or you know, just something else to add a little bit of vertical height and make it different. It's also a place you'd go sit a model, and here's my little test marine, he's gonna go sit up there. Makes for a nice little sniper's position. To further break up the profile, I took this takeout dish and cut it in half. It had that nice little ridge pattern that we see in a lot of sci-fi generators, so I thought it would be a good addition to the build. It just adds that extra element of sci-fi industry that really cements the setting and makes this building look like it actually belongs in the 41st millennium. 
Now we're going to jump back to the Nexus to showcase my favorite crafting component for industrial builds, these toy pipes. I'll leave a link for them in the description, you get a huge box of them on Amazon. And they just are so nice, they're a good scale, they're really easy to assemble, and you can use them in a wide variety of ways. You just hot glue them on and you get a ton of different shapes. They're also really nice and easy to cut, so if you have to trim them down in any way, shape, or form to make them fit, it's not a hard process to do. So, I'm just going to add pipes on both sides going off in weird angles just to make it look interesting. Where there are industrial sci-fi buildings, there are industrial sci-fi doors. So, once you cut out the shape of your door, a cool way to give it some detail is to cut out the same shape but in cereal box cardboard, and then cut out a little bit of a sci-fi design in it. I decided to make two quarter inch offsets, and then draw a little bit of a diagonal line, straight line, diagonal line, just to create that interlocking system that we see in a lot of secure sci-fi doors. It's just a cool little shape. I freehanded it kind of here, but you know, if you want to be a little bit more meticulous in your detail, you can go ahead and measure the whole thing out. Once you've cut it out, make sure you cut the cereal box cardboard into two pieces, and then glue them down onto your chipboard. You can leave them slightly apart, this is going to create a little bit of a crack that's going to give recess room for washes to flow in there and really create the detail you want in this kind of a door. However, if you wanted to make a big industrial garage door, an easy way to do this is with popsicle sticks. Here I'm taking two and putting a layer of hot glue along the seam, and then I'm going to take that third piece and place it on top. This is going to form one section of the garage door. I'm going to end up making three of these to put on the pump house. Once you have all your components, go ahead and hot glue them in place. Make sure you leave a little bit of that topmost popsicle stick showing, just for a little bit more added detail. Also make sure you don't have any hot glue flowing over into the middle piece so where it's visible. Go ahead and smooth that out with your fingers. Here I can find out that my last section is a little bit long, so I just came in with some scissors and trimmed off that bottom part. Scrape off the old hot glue for some new stuff, put it back in place, boop, boop, and there we go perfectly flush with the floor. Too easy. It was at this juncture that I started to catch myself letting the build expand across a bigger and bigger space, so I went out and cut some bases to contain myself. I cut the bases out of quarter inch MDF board and then sanded down the edges to create a nice bevel. Then came in with some hot glue and glued down all of my terrain pieces. It was at this point that I decided individually the pipeline and the generator were too small, but if I combined the two and added this Pringles can, I can make a nice little smokestack where smoke is feeding up through the pipe and turning a turbine that's then powering the generator before the smoke comes out the top of the Pringles can. And I figured that would be a cool little piece. So we're going to call this combination the smokestack from here on out. Over at the Nexus, I decided that it wasn't quite enough of a plumber's nightmare yet. So I grabbed some polystyrene rods and cut them at a 45 degree angle to create these nice elbow joints to give myself more smaller pipes. I then went and attached them all over the piece just to add more visual interest to any of the blank flat walls that I had. Once I'd settled on the idea for the Nexus to be this real hub of all the different plumbing and piping in this industrial facility, adding these additional smaller pipes and getting a nice variety in sizes really helps sell the image that there's all kinds of different things flowing through this one building. To add another different element, I also took some little squares of foam and some of the offcuts from my previous attempts at cutting out these pipes that didn't quite go so well, and combined them all to make these little juncture boxes. This element allowed me to keep with my overall pipe theme, but I didn't have to go overboard on creating an absolute army of these elbow joints. They say variety is the spice of life, and I find that that's definitely true for terrain building. The more different elements that you have, the more visual interest a piece will have. Another cornerstone of making any industrial facility is industrial walkways. Here I'm utilizing the Wylock's Armory method of industrial walkways, I'll link his full video in the description for how he does it. But the short and sweet version is you take a layer of chipboard and you smear it with PVA glue, then you come in and add a layer of cross stitching mesh to form your industrial grid, then you add a second layer of chipboard in which you have cut out an industrial shape. This can be as simple as a square or you can get really elaborate creating you know, crosses or axes or whatever else you want to make. It's up to you. Now, depending on where you're going to put your platforms, you might have to make different types of supports. If you're going to put it on top of the packing insert where the whole thing would likely be structurally sound, you're fine. However, I wanted to add this secondary lower platform here on the tank, and that little lip there wasn't going to be enough to support a full platform. So we're going to have to create some I-beams to support the other side. You can make I-beams out of a lot of different materials, but I'm going to go with popsicle sticks here. Once you cut off the rounded edges, they're exactly the right shape, and they're nice and rigid. 
Once I had them cut to the right length, I applied some Eileen's Tacky Glue to the side and then created the basic T shape. I like the Eileen's Tacky Glue because it holds it in place a little bit better than regular PVA glue while it dries. Which allows me to do this demo where I come in while the other side is still drying and put on the other side of glue and create the eye shape. When I was doing these in batches later for other parts, I would glue the T, then let it dry and then glue on the other thing just so I didn't have any slippage on either end. But for you guys, I take that additional risk and do it live. Once they're all dry, you can go ahead and hot glue them to the platform. One thing to remember here is that you're going to flip the platform over, so depending on how you've got your platform laid down, make sure you're putting these in the right corner. Once that lower platform's in place, I'm just going to come in and apply some hot glue to the top of the concrete and attach the upper platform. When I did the same thing for the wall platform, I made sure that I lined up the I-beams with the concrete buttresses that I had just to make things look a little bit more symmetrical. Then, once I got to the end of it, I flipped it over and figured out where I was going to have to cut this platform to make that damaged section where we have that collapsed wall at the end. Another solid material for making platforms is EVA foam with the right thickness. Here I cut it out using a drafting compass and my hobby knife, and then I hot glued it to the top of the smokestack. I added this platform because it added another vertical layer to the battlefield, and it becomes the high point of this whole particular set. If you can get a model up here, you're going to be able to see the whole field. I took some more popsicle sticks and made I-beams that were cut at a 45 degree angle to act as a support for this platform. The last thing I added was another strip of EVA foam that was 3 quarters of an inch wide to form a little bit of a railing to provide some cover for anyone who's up in that tower, and to hide some of the cuts like you can see at the bottom of the screen there where my knife was just a little bit too rough on the foam. As I'm sure you've guessed by this point, I'm never satisfied with the amount of detail on this project. So, when I looked at the pump house and I saw this little area in the back, I said to myself, ah, we've got room for more things. So, I cut the tops off two Powerade bottles that I had, and then grabbed some more of my toy plastic pipes to create some chemical containers. I like to think these tanks hold something that they're trying to add to whatever fluid is flowing through the pump house, kind of like the way you would add chlorine to a pool when it comes through the filter. Regardless of their fictional function, they're another way to break up line of sight on the battlefield, and they're a nice little space where a model could slip in behind the tank and get cover, then pop back out to shoot at anyone trying to get him. To cover up the gap that you can see between the pipe and the thing that I have in the top of the Powerade bottle, I grabbed some more of my thin foam strips and just cut a little piece to wrap around. Too easy. Where there are walkways and platforms, there need to be ways to get onto said walkways and platforms. One of the easiest ways to do this is to take some chicken wire and clip out sections of it to make ladders. This is a really quick and easy way to do it. Just take the diagonal cutters that you can see in the bottom corner, clip out a little section that looks like a ladder, and then hot glue it in place. Really simple, really effective, and it looks really nice for the scale. The platform I made for the Nexus was totally see-through, just so you could see all the fun piping underneath, but it was this big empty space and I felt I needed to fill it with something. In the same kit that I got my plastic pipes out of, I also had these little wheels, and I figured this would be a nice little valve on top of the big pipeline. You turn it one way, it diverts the flow into the left set of pipes, you turn it the other way, it goes right, and it's just a little something cool. So I cut out a little hole for it with my knife, and then did not glue any of this in place so that I could paint on the pipe without having any issues. Sub-assembly for the win. Another train maker called Narb Makes did a video on his channel a while ago where he did this modular walkway system using sheet metal and magnets. I will link his video in the description if you want to check it out. But I decided I wanted to incorporate his method into my terrain, just because modular walkways are cool in industrial settings. So I cut out some strips of sheet metal and hot glued them to my platforms. Remember that metal is a conductor of heat, so do not press it down with your bare hands. Grab a towel or something else to put between your hands so that you do not burn yourself. The last thing to do before getting into painting is some flocking of the bases. I started off with a little bit of spackle because, as you may recall from my very first video, I have this big dark mechanical volcanic board and I kind of wanted to theme it for that battle mat. So I came with a little spackle here and there just to create some more rocky areas, and it also helps me conceal any little gaps that might have emerged in various places, and blend the packing insert nice and smoothly into the base. Once the spackle had set, I came in with some PVA glue and a brush and applied a nice thin layer across the entire base. Once I had all the PVA glue on, I poured on a mixture of different types of sand and gravel just to create a nice gritty texture. I didn't want this to be as rocky as my demonic smelter, but I still wanted to have that kind of volcanic ash feel. Once that's all dry, you can start priming. And speaking of priming, I also took some of this Christmas snow and a black paint and primer and created some black smoke 
this is going to be pouring out of the big smokestack. I didn't want to leave this big hole where people could look and go, oh, look, it's a Pringles can. No, you fill the top with this, and it's a really nice decorative element. It's going to bring a lot of life to it. Before we jump into painting, we're going to take a quick look at all of the buildings to see how they looked at the end of the build process after they've been primed. You're going to see that I added a lot of different details that I didn't show on camera. However, in reality, I didn't use that many techniques. All the new details you're seeing here are just different applications of the same techniques you've already seen at different stages of this video. If I had shown you every little thing I did, that would make this video several hours long, which is a bit too long for a YouTube tutorial. That being said, there is one exception that I'm going to highlight here, and that is the rivets that I added. I didn't get film of this, and I don't know why I didn't, but, you know, that's on me. However, all I did was I took some nail beads that I got at the craft store and added a little bit of super glue on the back and then glued them in place. They add a lot of really simple detail, but it really makes these industrial pieces when you have those big heavy rivets. I don't know, there's just something about it that really locks in that industrial feel for me. So in these kind of builds, my motto is, when in doubt, rivets out. Once everything had been primed, I came in with a layer of gunmetal and a dry brush of a bright silver. This creates a nice distressed metal look that's going to form the base for all of our future steps. Anywhere where there was exposed concrete like this buttress here, I came in with a standard gray and gave that a nice coat, and then dry brushed it with a lighter gray to help bring out some of those raised details. Once all my base layers were set in, I came with a brown wash over all of the metal bits to start building up that wonderful rust. This is the wash from the Black Magic Crafts recipe, and I will link his video in the description so that you can make it for yourself. However, we need a little bit more rust. So I decided to add some orange paint to my brown wash to create a nice little nasty orange rust to complement the brown rust we've already put on. This mixture was a little bit thicker, so I started applying it with a smaller brush. I just decided to pick out some spots and just create a little bit of a random pattern with this orange rust just to complement everything. This is all going to be covered up in a minute and you'll see why, so don't be too hard on yourself if you see something you're like, oh that doesn't look quite natural, don't worry. It's all going to come out in the end. However, if you do get a little overzealous with the orange like I did here on the Nexus, don't worry about it. Just come in and give it a light dry brush with either your silver or your gunmetal, depending on how bright you want the metal to be. You'll still be able to see the orange through the dry brush, but this will restore more of that normal steel color that you had in the base. Once you're happy with how everything looks with your industrial grind, we're going to come on with some latex masking fluid and dab it on with a sponge. This stuff is used in watercolor paints to protect things you've already finished while you go on to work on a different part of the piece, but in Wargaming Train, I find that it creates a really gorgeous chipping effect with very little effort. So just go ahead and make a random pattern. If you don't like something, smudge it off with your finger. Go crazy, go not so crazy. It's all up to you, depending on how much chipping you want to see. When the latex fluid dries, it'll be clear, so you probably won't even remember where it is. But that doesn't matter. We're just going to slap some paint over it because it's all going to be fine in the end. Trust me. For the foreman's building, I decided to go with this olive drab green because it felt very managerial in a grim, dark, industrial way. I don't know. Just had that feel to it. I like it. It's nice, it's gritty, works well for the piece. Over at the pump house, I decided to go in with this heritage brick red. It's a little bit bright when it goes on, but give it a nice black or brown wash and it'll take on that nice industrial gritty tone that we're looking for in these pieces. Now, my brushwork's a little bit sloppy here, but I've pl already planned on coming in and repainting these bands with a little bit of a bronze, so that's something that I'd already pre-chosen. If you're not going to do that, make sure you're not getting paint everywhere like I am here. <laughs> For the last of the three colors I chose, we're going to turn to this off-white that I'm painting onto the smokestack. I've seen this color in a lot of reference photos for old Soviet industrial complexes that have rusted out since the fall of the USSR, so I felt that would suit nicely for this industrial complex in the grim darkness of the 41st millennium. I ended up adding a bit of a black wash just to create even more grime, but once everything was dry, I came in with a pencil eraser and started rubbing it on the terrain just to find where I'd put that latex masking fluid. As you can see, it comes up really nice and easy and gives you this really natural looking chipping effect. And if I'm being honest, it's just a lot of fun to attack your terrain with a pencil eraser. I don't know why, it's just fun. If there's been one thing that's really marked this project for me, it's been that I have been way too overzealous with the grime. Grandfather Nurgle would be proud. Anyway, I needed to fix this, so it's actually fairly simple to do. 
All you do is come in with a really light dry brush of the original color. If you're using the cheap craft paints, you will see they go on a little bit thicker than they come out in the finished product, and that's okay. You can always bounce back and forth between more and less grime until it looks exactly right to you. Speaking of overzealous grime, if you want to create a little bit of a mineral drip under the paint chips, you can always come in and add a little bit of a brown wash and create those streaking drips. This reflects the minerals from the metal being leached out by water and then that water slowly dripping down the paint and staining it with a rust color. I told you guys I was going to repaint these metal straps and here we go, let's do it. I decided to go for a base coat of this antique bronze just to give it a little bit of a difference from the steel we're seeing everywhere else. I think the variety adds something to the piece, just, you know, again, a little color differentiation, a little something different. Breaks up the overall look. I like it. To grime this up, again, come in with your brown wash. Only do a very little bit of the orange because bronze wouldn't rust in the same way that steel does, so you would see more of the green, but again, given the industrial field, we're not going to do that. And then I dry brushed it with a little bit of the gunmetal just to distress the metal a little bit more. Now there were a few places where the metal strips I had added for the magnetic walkways that I will build at some point in the future just kind of stood out a little bit too much. So if it's going to stand out anyway, make it stand out. And how do you make things stand out in an industrial setting? I'll tell you how. Hazard striping. Everybody loves it, and everybody hates painting it. However, I found this wonderful tape in one of the drawers I had laying around the house, and it was exactly the thickness I wanted for my hazard stripes. So. I just taped it all down on the platforms and then came in with the black. I decided to base coat with the yellow just because it's easier to work from yellow to black than black to yellow. It takes less coats, it's a lot faster. So just go ahead, you can be a little messy just because you've got the tape to create clean lines. And then once you're done with everything, you can go ahead and pull up the tape. Don't forget to come in at the end and give it a nice sturdy wash to match all the rest of the industrial grime we've spent so much time building up. Now it's time to go in and paint the bases. I'm trying to match particular battle mat I own, it's the volcanic mat from P-Works Wargames, so I started with a grey base coat and then came in and dry brushed on a black to start with. This is just going to help darken things up and build the base for this volcanic ash wastes. The next layer I came in with was a mix of black and purple. This is again to help match the battle mat, it's got a little bit of a purple tint to some of the areas where there's more rock than lava and ash. So, you know, I just wanted it to blend in no matter where it is on the table, so I'm mixing in that purple to give it just a little bit of that hue as I work towards this overall color. The next layer I came in with was a dark gray, and I just dry brushed this a little sporadically to create some variation. Some of the areas are going to have that purplish black, some are going to have this color. I find it creates a nice little variation in color and some visual interest for everyone who's looking at your terrain. For the next layer, again, because I have this purplish hue to deal with, I mixed in some purple into that gray and dry brushed again, just trying to hit the areas where I'd already made that gray to create some little purple highlights. You can do the basing however it best fits to your battle mat or whatever else you're using for a tabletop, but this is what I'm doing for this project. Again, just trying to create some variants, really match in with the colors that I have. The last thing I did was stipple on a little bit of the black wash just to break up the purple and just kind of restore some of the shadows that I might have gotten rid of during my a little bit over the top dry brushing. I'll admit I got a little carried away. I was getting to the end of the project, I was excited that it was coming together soon. But you know, hey, it's one of those things, easy to fix, and it all came together very nicely. Once that dried, I came in and gave it a coat of matte varnish just to protect all the work I'd done. And with that, we're done. Let's get some models on the table and showcase this terrain. When I sat down to do this video, I challenged myself to see how much terrain could I squeeze out of that one packing insert. The answer is I got six fairly decently sized pieces of terrain out of it, and I'm really happy with how it looks. Not only does it have that lovely grim dark industrial aesthetic, but from a rules perspective, and you guys know that that's something I care deeply about, you got a lot of different elements in this terrain. We've got areas that are line of sight blocking, we've got areas that you can see through but would probably count for a sort of dense cover like we have in 40k where you get that minus one to hit. We've got a ton of changes in elevation which I really like and for the new kill team which is dropping the day this video releases, getting higher up and gaining those vantage points seems like a really important way to get line of sight to targets. So I'm really excited to play kill team on this board. It won't be the battle report I'm doing now that I've hit 100 subscribers, that will be, as I promised, over on the red versus blue board, but if that video does well and you guys like me doing battle reports, maybe I'll come over here and do a kill team report here as well. We'll see. Regardless, I had a lot of fun with this build. 
And I hope it inspired you guys to take a second look at some things that you would normally throw away, like a packing insert. Inspiration can come from the unlikeliest of places, and I hope this video helped show you some techniques that you can use to take a pretty simple base material and turn it into something that will look amazing on your tabletop. If you enjoyed the content, give us a like, leave us a comment, and subscribe to the channel to keep up to date on all our future content. It doesn't cost you anything, but it supplies me with a steady stream of motivation to keep trying new things and building new projects. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you again the next time we ignite the Forge of Sagas.